It's English time on your local television. Today in the Weekly Mac, we will talk about superstitions. Leo Margetz. This poker world champion have witnessed very strange superstitions throughout her professional career. Monica Green is going to perform an a cappella song. It will leave you breathless, you'll see. And of course, Mark Broderick and Matthew Tree are going to have their moment of latitude. Today in the Weekly Mac, these and many other surprises. Listen, you shouldn't miss this show, hosted by Martella Topor. Hello, this is the Weekly Mag, and today we are focusing on a very peculiar subject, superstitions. Black cats, lucky garments, objects to ward off evil, all this and much more is going to feature in today's show. And our first guest is part of a world in which there are many, many superstitions poker. But before presenting it, I recommend that you listen carefully to the following glossary of words, which we hope will help you understand better the interview. The first expression that will appear during the interview is decision making. The name says it all. It's the process of choosing what should be done or which is the best of various possible actions. The second concept is a verb, to master. If you master something, you learn how to do it properly or you succeed in understanding it completely. One more word, timing. It's the skill or action of judging the right moment in a situation or activity at which to do something. It is also used to refer to the time at which something happens or is planned to happen. And last but not least, an important concept when playing poker, bluff. If you bluff, you mislead or deceive. You make someone believe something that is not true. Usually to take advantage for yourself. For example, you deceive an opponent in poker by betting heavily on a weak hand. When playing poker, you can dispel bad luck if you wear dirty clothes. You might cross out of luck if you sit cross-legged. Wearing the color red will bring you good luck. And these are just three examples of the many superstitions we can find among poker players around the world. And that's why we thought it was a good idea to invite a professional poker player to talk to her about this topic and many others. Leo Margetz, welcome to the Weekly Mag. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here. So today we talk about superstitions and the first question is, how superstitious are you? Uh, probably minus 10. <laughs> no, to be honest, some of the superstitions you just mentioned related to the poker world is the first time I hear them. Really? But, yeah, but I'm aware the, the poker world is full of superstitions, but I think the more professional you become, the least you rely on those. I because see. obviously they are, they are just limiting your decision making. But it's kind of fun to know they exist because you can take advantage from people who obviously are very superstitious. Ah, oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, you studied business in London, uh, management of communication companies in Barcelona. You got a job in marketing and then, at the age of uh, 24, I think, you yeah. decided to leave everything and become a professional poker player. So, how did that happen? Yeah, well, as you see, like, it's funny because when I tell my story, uh, everyone tells, yeah, that you were having the life every parent <laughs> wants their kids to, to do, you know, like yes. I studied, did a master, started working in a kind of nice job, but then in the meanwhile, I started to play poker because mm -hmm. I, my previous boyfriend used to play and it was actually by accident that I, one day I went with him in a poker game and I got fascinated. Obviously the first day it was a bit boring because I was not understanding everything, mm -hmm. but you I had never played before. I'd never played before. Mm -hmm. I used to not be kind of a, a card game lover, like, I, 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 you know, not even like table games. Mm -hmm. um, I had other hobbies as a, as a girl, but then with poker I realized it was so way more than just a card game. And mm -hmm. I don't want to get too intense, but I think yes. it's, poker is, is so more than that. Like it's the psychology, it's a negotiation, it's maths, because there's, there has so much of, you know, probabilities and statistics behind. Mm -hmm. It's a game of people, and, and, and then I decided I, I wanted to improve and to get better. I never decided I want to become a pro. It was not really in the plans, but I really decided to put my time into it, and I studied a lot, started playing a lot, we joined a poker club. Mm -hmm. And the first time you played, you remember what uh, it was I remember. Like? Did you win? I <laughs> did win. You know, timing is key, and then of course you, uh, I think it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, no? When you win your 
first uh, poker game and you think you are awesome mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you don't understand the game so much and you think that if you if one day you win 500 euros then imagine how much money you can make and obviously it doesn't work like this mm -hmm. it was a poker game in a club with some with some other people mm -hmm. and yeah and I won and I remember it's probably one of the best memories I have from poker uh, obviously I did not know anything about the game as I know now mm -hmm. but the least you know sometimes the least you know about something the more confident you are and then once you start scratching into into it more deeply you realize that it's a game you you know you, you learn the rules in 10 minutes but you can you need a whole life to master it because it's also a changing game that evolves mm -hmm. and probably that's what kept me you know mm -hmm. still here like more than 10 years later okay and what did your parents say when they found out that you had decided to drop everything and become a poker professional At the beginning, player? they were mm, not very chill about it. It's not, they, they saw I was happy and you know that I, I was like not... I've, like never, what? I've never been kind of a... I, I've always been very responsible and, and kind of, you know, never been like very... Well, I was a bit troubled, but more kind of emotionally than, you know, than, than for the typical things people measure. But then something happened that I always tell them that we were lucky in the sense that I had very good timing. It was only a year after I dropped uh, my job mm -hmm. that I went to Vegas for the main event. It's like the, 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 the World Series in Las Vegas every summer is the World Championship, is La Meca, the Mecca of, of poker. And yes. in the main event, which is the most important tournament of the year, I finished 27th out of almost 7,000 players. Mm, wow. And also in the United States, they give a lot of importance to the last woman standing, which doesn't make much sense. It gives for another chapter though, because you know, it's like, it, it shouldn't be, it doesn't make a difference whether you are a man or a woman, but still they mm -hmm. made a, a deal out of it. I got like a cap for being the last female standing and mm -hmm. that changed my life. And, and that, that means world champion? The world champion. Mm. And then, uh, I got a lot of attention and I, uh, I got a sponsor and I started, you know, like, I, it really made the difference uh, in my life. But of course, that... In it's when you decided to become a professional player? Oh, or I was, was already that, playing. Uh, I was already, I had already quitted my job, mm -hmm. but that changed everything. Of course, it's like, it, it made my way up way more easy mm -hmm, because I of see. the huge price and especially because of uh, the possibility to play with a, with a sponsor and also the acceptance because everyone uh, accepted a lot, like all the news about it. I got a lot of media coverage from non-specialized media like mm -hmm. general media and uh, my parents were kind of, I think it's very unfair, but that specific event made them kind of proud, which is I, could, I would have been exactly the same if I did not have this, that specific win in Vegas that summer, but made things easier. And at the end of the day, you mm -hmm. know, sometimes you just get mm -hmm. a good timing and that changes a lot of things and that's what happened. So I, I made the most of that uh, event. Okay. Um, for, most, uh, for most people, um, being a woman and a professional poker player, that's kind of exotic. Okay, we can't uh, deny that. It's still it's still like yeah, this. Yeah, that's so, reality. No? Yeah. So, um, uh, what does it feel like to, to, be a, to be a poker player, professional a poker player? What's your daily routine? What does that imply to in me, your life? Yeah, to me, it's not that exotic. Obviously, from outside, it's always, you know, people just pay attention to, oh, she was in Bahamas last week and now Monte Carlo, then Las Vegas, Paris. But, <laughs> you know, that also implies a lot of time traveling, a lot of, uh, you know, airports, which is not nice, a lot of time outside home, which as you grow up, all, it, it, it gets a bit annoying. But it's a lifestyle and I love it. To me, it's just, my, a, a day, I don't know, a, a day, I don't have a routine, but if I'm not traveling, I'll just um, play online, study a bit. I try to study at least three times uh, per week, kind mm -hmm. of between two and five hours. Okay. When I mean studies, reviewing hands, you know, like analyzing moves so that, because in game, when you are playing, uh, sometimes the decisions need to be made fast. So you cannot really go through all the maths, but if you practice at home and you know what's the best move and what, what are the lines, I don't want to get too specific, but what are the lines that will be more profitable, then you can apply them when you are playing in the moment. 
Um, so watching videos. Uh, but um, how many hours do you practice um, daily, more or less? Because this is, I didn't know uh, about poker, the fact that it is actually considered a sport, like chess. What? In Brazil, it's yeah. considered a sport. I think it's a skill game because I practice a lot of sport as well. And I think in general, sport, uh, the big difference from sport is that uh, you results uh, are linked to effort in a shorter uh, time lapse mm -hmm. than it does in poker. Oh, which also, which poker, that, that's good about poker that it, it makes you think a lot in the long run, you know, and, and it implies dedication. But in the short run, uh, poker is still affected way more than sport mm -hmm. um, by luck. Okay, and which are the qualities uh, required? Uh, which qualities do you need to be a good uh, poker player? That's, that's a very interesting question because um, I think uh, to be an excellent poker player, you need to have some qualities that sometimes are Mm, doesn't happen naturally in one person. Mm -hmm. You know, you need because you need this kind of empathy to read people, but you need to be cold and and not let your emotions, you know, kick so, in to boycott your decision making. Yes. You need to you need to have this. Um, uh, you need to be able. You need to, to be cool, right? No, you need to. No, no, you need to be patient. Seem, seem cool. No. At least. Well, yeah, <laughs> of course. You need to be a bit of. A, you need, to, of course, you need to be able to hold your emotions. But then. If you hold them too much, you are not able to empathize with people. And the more you empathize, the more the more you read them. Mm -hmm. And obviously, reading people is very important. But you also need to be patient, but you need to be aggressive, because mm -hmm. the one that takes the initiative it has a huge advantage. So it reunites a lot of qualities that sometimes, um, you know, you are from one side or the other. It's kind of hard to develop all those qualities in a natural way. You need to work mm -hmm. on them. Exactly, like bluffing, no? which is a famous uh, thing. Yeah, in. just another tool. Any professional will tell you, yeah, you, you cannot overdo, otherwise you become predictable, you know, and exploitable. Yes. When I mean exploitable, mm -hmm. is someone you can take advantage over because if you know they are bluffing more than they should, obviously you have an advantage over them. But of course, it's another tool. By when you say you are a poker player, all of a sudden people become very defensive, I think, because they probably think, oh, she's going to be overanalyzing me, uh, you know, like trying to detect whether I'm lying or not. I chill out when I'm in real life. Okay. You know, I don't, I don't want to be a... Uh, I, I'm not in poker mood. I change a lot oh, from my real life. Good. Actually, when That's people good. know me, first time it's like, I think I'm quite see-through. People wonder, uh, how can she play poker <laughs> well? <laughs> Well, but you also travel a lot. Um, you mentioned, uh, well, obviously, Las Vegas and uh, Monaco and Paris and all these uh, world uh, capitals. But um, have you ever traveled or played in uh, Gambia? Never. Hmm? It might seem a weird question, but this uh, is, uh, I can uh, answer uh, probably your, your uh, doubts because our next section uh, talks about uh, Gambia. We'll uh, go to the next uh, section and then we'll continue the conversation. Perfect. Well, uh, Gambia is precisely um, our next uh, destination. It shares historical roots with many other West African na nations in the slave trade, which was the key factor in placing and keeping of a colony on the Gambia River. And nowadays it is a proud country with an economy dominated by farming, fishing and especially tourism. And of course, our e-speaker protagonist, Ebrima Dem, believes it is the most beautiful country in the world. My name is Ebrima Dem, okay, and then I'm from Gambia, a very beautiful country. And then um, I live here in Barcelona since um, 2011. Gambia is one of the most beautiful countries in the world. Um, it's a green country, it's a country where you can find green space. It's having a lot of islands and beautiful beaches. In addition to that, Gambia is, a, is the smallest country in mainland Africa. The country is divided into two parts by the river Gambia, in which you find people living at both sides um, of the river. And then um, culturally, Gambia is beautiful. It's really um, diverse. We are made up of different ethnic groups, and each of them you know, practicing you know, their own culture in a way, but still living together uh, peacefully. The 
Gambia is called the, smi the smiling coast of Africa. Because in Gambia, everybody smiles and everybody feels welcome. And then we love to care and say little things that we have. So if you're looking to go to Gambia, if you're looking to go to West Africa, if you, if you have never been to West Africa before, it's better to go to Gambia because it's the door, it's the entrance of Africa. And so once you feel the welcoming nature of Africa, then you feel more happy to go into the interior of the continent. I guess some of you might have heard about Kunta Kinte. Okay, he's from Gambia. He's from a small um, um, fishing town, an island town called Jufre. Uh, the reason why Gambia was very significant for the slave trade is because of its strategic reason. We have islands, especially the one we call um, James Island. Now we have changed it to Kunta Kinte Island, you know, to you know, to, to pay homage to um, to this great you know, warrior who stood to say that nobody should change his name, that his name is Kunta, because he knew the significance of having a name. So this island was meant to where most of the time the slave ships before being transported to the, um, to the Americas as well as to, to England. So right now we still have most of this monument, you know, of, you know, try to explain to you the horrific, you know, nature of the slave trade and how this have impacted, you know, on the life of the Gambian people. If you want to go to Gambia, um, we have several dishes and the most of our recipe is actually uh, rice. Okay, rice is our staple food. And then fish, because we have abundance of fish, you know, and it's not expensive. And then one of our best recipe is called mafe. Okay, Maf or sometimes we call it domoda, depending on which of the, the ethnic group that you're talking with. And then this mafe is peanut butter soup. First you have to, um, you have to roast the, 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 the peanut and then grind them into a paste and then you cook them until you see the oil coming out of it. Then you put some meat or fish if you have one and then put some vegetable. Then this is served with white rice. And then the other one which I really, really like most is called super kanja. Okay, super kanja is okra soup. Okay, okra mixed with, um, with garlic as well as, you know, some kind of stew with a little bit of salt and some palm oil. Yeah, actually in Gambia we have something that is very unique in Gambia that makes everybody feel the same, everybody feel, feel um, together. Uh, we call it, uh, in our local language, we call it kal in Wolof, or sometimes we call it sanaku you know, in another language. This is like um, a kind of a way in which um, people from different surnames, you know, can say something to another without, you know, making the other person feel angry. Like for example, if I say, oh, you look like, today you look very dull today, or you look very ugly. But still we laugh at it because we, he knew that we have, shares, we have similar surnames and these surnames, they have this kind of relationship among themselves. I think this is a unique nature that's really, you know, one thing that helps to put the society together because, you know, people don't just get easily offended. We always smile because we knew that, you know, this relationship is there. Yeah, one thing is very important is, is like we have to understand that Gambia right now, almost 95% of Gambia are Muslims. So um, right now, most of the, our festivities are, are, are religiously oriented. One of them, which we call Tobaski. In this day, we kill ram and everybody is welcome. So when we kill the ram, it's not just for killing the ram, but also sharing the meat. And in addition to that also, um, recently the government have initiated um, a program called the Root Festival. The Root Festival is, um, is, um, is designed from the, from the book of um, Kunta Kinte called Alex Haley in which we try to invite Africans in the diaspora and African Americans to pay homage or to make a pilgrimage to Gambia so they were able to learn more about their culture and they try to learn more about their history so they were able to process, at least try to promote Afrocentricity, Afrocentricity and the, the belief of an African, you know, of, a, the, of an African person, of what he believed to be an African. Today we'll be on the red carpet in Los Angeles to find out what superstitions are hiding out there in a few moments. Well, today we are joined here by uh, Leo Marzetz, who is a professional poker player and also by a very special collaborator. For us, an actor who comes from LA, Sergio Cervera. Hi, Mars. Hi again. Hi. Well, it's great to have you here today. Are you oh, ready? Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks we'll for see. having me, by we'll the way. See. Well, as you see, we've changed the set because we want to give you a practical explanation about how it goes in a poker game. And uh, we're going to play today a very popular version of poker, which is called Texas Hold'em. Is that right, yes. Leo? Yeah, very yeah. right. Okay, how many uh, versions of uh, poker are there? Oh, there's plenty of formats, but uh, Texas Hold'em, No Limit Texas Hold'em is the beast. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think the reason is probably that is the one that is more enjoyable, that you can enjoy the most if you watch on TV, and that's why it became so popular. Okay. Well, let's hope our viewers will uh, enjoy it. Our <laughs> own version of uh, Texas uh, yeah. Hold'em. How does it work? So, um, and we've already rifled the dealer. It's on you, and you are gonna. We, we have to put. There's two compulsory bets, which is small blind and big blind. I'm the All big right. blind. You are the small blind, the small which blind. is half of the big blind. Mm -hmm. And then you deal uh, two cards to each participant. Okay, so I'm the dealer. It yes. says it here. <laughs> yeah. The boss. The button. <laughs> and then okay. you proceed with the dealing as the dealer. Okay. All right. All right. Nervous? Oh, yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. You but can win a lot of money today. I, I already... Okay, I start we with Sergi. Yes. <laughs> I got some, which I'm going to lose <laughs> in the next hand. Ellie, what's next? So we've got the cards. Can we have a look at them? You should have a look at them and okay. decide whether you want to join the game or not. All and right. The minimum you can put is okay. two, but you I can put call I, like I put 10 one. million, I no? Have? No, you have to wait until she decides okay. what to do. Okay. Um, I, I go for it, yeah. With the one? But no, no, at least two. This at least two? Yes. At least two, okay. And now it's your turn. Now that we are on camera, I'm not rising uh, with 500. That was just for the rehearsal, so I'll go with two. Two more. Okay. Uh, okay, you need the minimum you can raise is four. All right. If you are go going to raise, the mm -hmm. minimum is four. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. There we go. But then wow. you said four, so okay. it's four. Okay. Okay, for the camera, we play. I'm not sure I'll always play this one, <laughs> but All right. since we are on the. T and you have to put only two more. Honestly, for the, for pot odds, you should call. Like, there's so much in the pot. But I can decide if I want to go on or not. You can decide whether yes. you, you can pass, mm -hmm. you can join for two more, or you can raise again. All right, well, considering the cards I've got, I think I'm going to just you know, pass. Okay. <laughs> and in, in poker, you say, fall. 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 Uh, which so I fall. You fall, but, but you, sh you need to put two to win 12, you know, for an investment of two, but you've already said pass, but for I an investment exactly. of two, you would have had the potential of winning 12. So mathematically, no matter what cards you had, you should have called. Oh, but interesting. Too late. Yeah, yeah, because, interesting. Yeah. Too late. She's, no, yeah. Because She's no, but, I can play. I can play. No, but okay, okay. Well, Sergi will win We're making me. a team here because okay. 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 we need some okay. support. Okay. Okay, then uh, you passed, so the cards are... In the match, yes. Then we are. So if that's a team, that's officially a team. Should I fold or should I play? No. Well, uh, now you need to you need to put the three the flop. You need oh, to. Oh, that's true. Exactly the the flop. Oh, so you yes. burn one, 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 one Exactly one covered and the other three uncovered. But yeah, exactly. All right. Exactly one and it's and covered three. and uncovered. Yes. Uncovered, uncovered, and uncovered. Okay. All right. And you speak. I fold. Are you agree? Um, I leave you to decide. All right, all right. So I fold. And yeah. That hand is for you. Yes, which is awesome because you could have passed okay. at no cost, and I can. You know, you if you pass, mm -hmm. you are still in the hand. Imagine As you, is fold. No, pass oh, is. Oh, oh, okay. Pass okay. is check. If you check, means I don't want to bet. But you don't need to fold. Uh, I wanted to say pass instead of fold. Uh, no, yes, that, does well, that work? It's just that's a matter of vocabulary. A, exactly, it's no? a matter of vocabulary. No, because no, because you said already, uh, and you can have the pot. So you meant fold. You are so good. <laughs> you are so good. I said so. Yeah. That's true. That's no, you true. Know, but you know what I mean, right? Uh -huh. If you say fold, uh -huh. you kind of let go your hand. Okay. If you pass, imagine you had, for example, two eights. Yeah. I you can say pass to let to seem weak. Uh -huh. So that I think, oh, he passes, he checks, okay. he's weak, 
So I'm gonna bet and then you re-raise me. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Okay. Interesting. We'll I'm not doing that. Today. <laughs> okay. So I right. take the pot. I always the take the pot. pot. Yeah, but, but <laughs> let's 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 tell everyone that I got I got yeah. the, the, the um, <laughs> previous hand. I, I want to say that. Well, I, public, think it's, I, do, um, I do acknowledge in public that he did win the previous hand. Yes. Anyway, maybe it was uh, uh, the problem of the colors. It was the problem yeah. of the colors. Yeah. It's she, not. This is not my us. color. She's anyway, it's not my lucky color. So yeah, I agree. Or my lucky number. Anyway, so today we're talking about uh, superstitions. Correct. No? Correct. Mm -hmm. So, um, what did you find uh, out in, uh, in LA about uh, superstitions? Well, superstitions are very interesting because technically means like, like you are depending on something that you cannot control and that controls everything. So that's up to everyone to believe in. But as we expose some of the superstition with cars in LA, I mean, this is, that's Hollywood. I mean, what other place has more superstitions than, than there? And there is a, a few funny examples. For example, the best actress winning curse. There is a curse. Really? Exactly, for actress winning. Mm -hmm. uh, award. Uh, so the, the actresses who has won the Oscar, for example, and like they say, and there is actually a, a, an, an official study, and I have I have some some of the information here, which is uh, the Carnage Mellon st study that I guess is like the University of Massachusetts or some of those okay. places that everyone says like mm, that yes. that that's really serious, and they say that 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 the winners, that the Oscar winners, the, the best actors Oscar winners are 63 percent more likely to get divorced. Wow. after winning the Oscar than those actresses who don't win, mm -hmm. for example. And, and for instance, there is uh, Winnet Paltrow, for example, who was considered with Ben Affleck like the couple uh, in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. And she won the Oscar for Shakespeare in Love. And one year after they were, I mean, their marriage with Ben Affleck was gone, for example. Oh. Same happened with Ronald Reagan, who is like the only the only U.S. president divorced. You were saying that in, in Hollywood, in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. uh, there are there are so more many, weird many people rituals. with weird rituals. Correct, correct, mm -hmm. correct. This is a, that's as? a place, that, and in my experience, I've seen uh, that because it's related to people's dreams. They are the people who is, as, 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 as she represents, for example, the people mm -hmm. who's committed to their work and hard workers, like, I'm going to keep working and working and working until I get whatever I want. And the people who relate their dreams or their expectations to anything else mm -hmm. but themselves. And, and that brings you... Oh, sorry. Some famous people who do uh, for example, strange rituals. Cameron Diaz has an really? obsession of knocking on wood. As, as, uh, as uh, President Underwood in, in House of Cars. And she, unlike, uh, unlikely most of the people, thinks that black cats brings you good luck, for example. And there is like Jessica Alba, who, who when she was pregnant in 2008, she gave rosaries to everyone around her and she asked all her friends surrounding her mm -hmm. to use them until she... I she, see. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, what about you? You said you're not superstitious, I'm but not do you have any rituals? Well, you know what? Way? I used to be very skeptical about rituals because, as I said, I link them with superstitions. But then I think if you, like, the example I like the most, we all see Rafa Nadal, for mm -hmm. example, every time before he's going to serve, you know, like the underwear thing, the socks. The, and you think, is this superstitious? I don't think it's really superstitious. Not I think necessarily. It's a ritual that I think it helps him focus and reset. But do you believe in bad luck, for example? No. No. That's a good, that, that, that's a question because sometimes there is people who always you know what I mean. Blame like, it on the bad luck. Do I okay. I think I believe. I, I I know not believe. I know there's things you cannot control. It's all about uncertainty and people mm -hmm. freak yeah. out so much about yeah, uncertainty there you go. Yeah, I, I, I that they need to control. And I'm a bit of a control freak, but I've done a lot of effort and accepting that we don't have control on everything. Oh, of mm -hmm. course not. But in other at the same time, I know the things I can control. I cannot control probably the end result of anything of uh, particular, but I can. Con I, I cannot have as a goal. I want to win the main event, mm -hmm. but as I a go see. but as a goal, I can say I, I want to study five hours every day and I want to give my best every time I sit at a poker table. That's absolutely uh, under my control. So that's the kind the kind of things I want to focus on. Okay, and I would like to ask you. Um, who are the most famous people you've played poker with? Oh, yeah, that's Matt Damon. Oh, oh, oh nice. Yeah, in a you know a little bit of, of Hollywood then. Oh, okay. well, yeah. There who you else? go. Yeah, who else? 
a um, Ronaldo, but the, not the Ronaldo, current Ronaldo, not the one that is playing now, the one that used to play before. All right. I, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, Ronaldo. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I play. Um, well, of People course, I play here? Piquet. Uh, but uh, in the same, Piquet. not the same table, but the same tournament. Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, I want to ask you uh -huh. uh, about um, your English. Obviously, uh, you uh, use English when you travel and you play poker with uh, with people from uh, from other countries. And you, Sergi, in uh, in uh, Los Angeles. Right. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Well, half of the. Half, I mean, part of the year I spend part of the year here and part of the year there, and mm -hmm. it's been like that since 2013. Mm -hmm. And I got documents and the visas and the permits mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. whatever, so I work there and here. And you've just got back from Los Angeles. Correct. Have correct. you brought uh, anything? A little yes, present for us? Yes, exactly. Yes, actually, I collaborate with a TV station over there, LA TV, Los Angeles Television, and uh, and. Well, we are collaborating together and we have, uh, I mean, they're very kind, especially because they let me collaborate with them and work there. And uh, there is a person who is kinder, I mean, he's, who's more kind than, I mean, everyone's kind, but she's very, very, very kind, Maria yes. Bracero. Maria? Bracero. Okay. And she's going to be our ears and eyes in the La La Land. And she was on a red carpet recently. She asked them, she went there and Correct. asked them about? Superstitions okay. and how superstitious mm -hmm. they are. Okay, yeah. so let's watch the video. Let's see. Marcela, Sergi, we are here at the 24th edition of the Spanish Recent Cinema. And we are about to find out how superstitious are the people walking this red carpet? How superstitious are you? Very, I'm not gonna lie, very. I would say I'm not very superstitious, but I somehow avoid like, you know, just crossing under um, stairs or just not telling people what I'm gonna do, like what projects are coming up if they're not signed yet. I'm very superstitious. I'm the producer of campeones, champions. Uh, depends. <laughs> what do you mean? Zero. I am very superstitious. Too much. Oh man, I think I am very superstitious, yeah. I'm not. <laughs> On a set, who's the most superstitious? Maybe the producer as, um, you know, as for the rain, they put some mirrors you know, in the floor towards the ceiling or towards the, the sky to avoid raining. Maybe they were singing to the god of the sun. <laughs> Probably, I'd say the art director. It's like if this couch is here, it's supposed to be there, but if you put it in a different direction, maybe it'll just give the movie bad luck. Okay, what's the, the your, where the superstition? Uh, okay, so before I go on stage, I have to put my left shoe before my right. Oh, you left before. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not superstitious, but I got um, kind of superstition in theater that I always start with my right foot. Some of the crazy members of my family, they do like this, this uh, rounds. Okay. You know, they run around the, we have a, a house in a beach complex and they just run around the complex. If you break an egg and yeah. the egg has like little veins, like red mm -hmm. veins, that means bad luck, and you cannot eat the egg. I've heard that if you like, if you use an umbrella inside uh, under a roof, you're never going to get married. I don't think it's true. <laughs> Is there any color that you would never wear to a premiere? No, I love yellow. Yay! Yeah. I love yellow too. No, my love, I love every color. I'm a colorful and shiny person. I'm an actress in a red carpet with yellow. Damn. Maybe. The only thing that I might think of is a black cat. If I see a black cat, I try not to cross his path, so I, I follow him, you know, just go parallel. Why would you be scared of a black cat? They're so cute! They are, they I love, are. I love kitties. Marcela, Sergi, this is it for tonight. Now I'm gonna go and see the movie, because it looks really good. And I'm just gonna try not to step on any lines, just in case. Well, thank you to Maria. Mm -hmm. And I see that in Los Angeles, superstitions are almost everywhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, everything, everyone wants to have control on everything. As, as they don't, they believe in superstitions. It's funny because I'm, as an outsider of the industry, I still, I could see a lot of relationships, uh, of, of, uh, of relations, sorry, between uh, poker and kind of acting, where I can you, see. you still need 
a bit of luck to make the most of the timing. You know, I, I'm pretty sure yes. a lot of the actors that are less mediatic or less well known and that get but they, not so they, much they make that for a living, for example. Exactly, and they are probably as good technically or charming than the big ones. Yeah. And same happens with poker. You know, like I, uh, I, I got lucky enough to to have a good timing to do a good result in one specific tournament that helped me then get a sponsor. Now you know, Winamax is sponsoring me. I belong to a team. There's a lot of other yeah. uh, players, uh -huh. even even better, that can be even technically better, but got less of a momentum. And I think both of you like challenges, of course. Yeah. Yes. Right? And uh, that's why uh, we thought uh, of asking you some, uh, some questions, mystery questions uh, in this case. And uh, they will be brought to us by Mark Broderick, who is our Irish uh, collaborator. Where is he? How's it going? Yay. Hello, Mark. Back Hi. with a How box of today? tricks. Yes? Not too bad. Nice. Here you and, go. And okay. Best of luck. Thank Hold you. on, wait, 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 one second. Hold one second. on, one second. Oh, I'm yeah. nervous now. Don't, don't get all nervous on me. I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so basically, mm -hmm. uh, open up. You have some questions here that well, Out loud. cover a wide range of topics. Me too? Out loud? Yeah, sure, okay. fire away. Oh, I do. Can you read it out? It's very appropriate. Is it? Yes. Go for it. I, I can't read it uh, from there. You, you have, have to read it. Do you have any silly nicknames? Poker is all about nicknames because we play online as well, so uh -huh. we all have to have like an alias for our screen names. Uh -huh. What's yours? Oh, I can't say. Come on. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, no. I, I can't. I can't. No, okay. to be honest, now, because I got, as I said, I belong to a team and I'm a pro at Winamax, which is a poker site. My nickname is not very glamorous, it's just Leo Margetts. Okay. But I've had terrible nicknames. Terrible nicknames. Ass. Okay, Such I my, Miss Pickies. Miss Pickies. Miss Pickies. Quite terrible. Quite, I, I know, but you're making me acknowledge this in public and I have an image. <laughs> <laughs> but I, if you're I, playing online, you don't really have an image. You can just put up any photograph. Well, but there. no, but people, you know, uh, we have uh, softwares that track nicknames. No. Uh, uh. Behavior. Yeah, that's... By behavior? Well, by patterns, like, you know, tendencies. So yeah, patterns. In this, in this position, he raises 33% of the time. Yeah, so... Oh, my You gosh. associate numbers, you know, you have data okay. on certain nicknames. So that's a very okay. appropriate And you, Sergi? Mm -hmm. uh, do you ever talk to yourself in the mirror? When was the last time? <laughs> well, that's very appropriate too. That's no? very because appropriate for an actor. I'm talking with an actor I, here. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have to say, as we are on camera... Uh, and nobody's is, watching exactly, you. Exactly. Nobody's <laughs> watching me and there is no way to avoid the question. I have to say that, of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> what language do you speak to yourself in the mirror? What language? It yeah. depends, actually. It depends. Catalan or English? It depends, yeah. Okay. Never, Sometimes, sp never Spanish? Sometimes, maybe. It depends on the, on the place I'm staying. And okay. as most of the time I am here in Barcelona and all mm -hmm. the times I'm in the States, it's funny, but sometimes when I'm in the States, I talk to myself in English and I mm -hmm. don't actually know why. Mm -hmm. I do good. it to practice as well. I, I oh, honestly okay. do it as well. I speak to myself in another language to see how it comes out of my yeah, mouth. That's you know, yeah, that's exactly. If I get the right pronunciation. How it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a good exercise. That is, in yeah. Fact. To practice, it works. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I try to practice in French sometimes. Yeah, but that's different. The conversation gets really, really much smaller. Well, anyway, guys, thanks so much for coming today. No, this only has one been fun. Ball. Sorry? Only one surprise ball. Only, only one. one. You want another one? No, no, I'm just kidding. I love no, it. No, that means that you <laughs> yeah. want more questions. <laughs> well, anyway, next time maybe you uh, will have uh, two balls. Uh, of the record. Oh, again. God. Yes? Uh, well, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Ahem! Who knows? Uh, okay. uh, Leo Marzet, thank you so much for coming today. <laughs> no, no, I had mm -hmm. a really good time. And good luck with everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. I take it. All right, well, uh, Sergi, we'll uh, see you again soon, no? Mm -hmm. You stay here in Catalonia, you're not going yeah, to for Los a while. Angeles? Yeah, for a while. Excellent, so we'll see you again soon. Thank I you. hope so, thank mm -hmm. you, Marcella. And Mark, I'll see you in a minute. See you in a bit. With Matthew, right? Sure, yeah. All right. Well, and today in our tips, we will know some words related to superstitions. Do you know? what a harbinger is. Well, pay attention to the explanations given to us by our English teacher, Slate Morgan. You will learn the meaning of this and other words related to superstitions. Hi there. Today we're going to look at some words related to superstitions. So let's start with two of the easiest. Being lucky or unlucky means having good or bad things happen to you by chance. There is no reasonable explanation to their existence. They depend on beliefs, the feeling of being certain. There's no scientific proof or verifiable facts to justify it. We're in the realm of faith. 
This is where words like harbinger make sense. A harbinger is a person or thing that we believe shows something about the future. And it's usually a bad thing. So take a black cat, for example. Some people believe that a, uh, that a black cat is a harbinger of bad luck. That same black cat could also be an omen, also a sign that something is going to happen. Omens do not necessarily have to be a bad thing. They can be good. Seeing a shooting star, for example, is a good thing and might mean that something good is going to happen. We're in the realm of spells. Spells are spoken words believed to have magical power, such as abracadabra. See you next time. I want Jesus, Jesus, Have you ever heard Jesus, Monica Jesus, Green's amazing Jesus, voice? Well, today she's singing on our stage specially for you. Don't miss it. To walk with me. In our modern world, we consider superstitions a lower type of knowledge. George Bernard Shaw called them bastard daughters of science and philosophy. Nevertheless, there are many things that we still cannot explain with science or reason. And to justify them, we resort to luck or faith. And at this point, it's when the discrepancy arises. And today, we are going to talk about this issue in our face-off. Our two contenders today are Donica Tiernan and Patricia Scalona. Welcome. Thank you. Well, okay. And hello. the question today is, are you guys superstitious? Do you believe in uh, supernatural uh, phenomena? Patricia, you oh, first. Not at all. Not at all. No, not at all. I'm super skeptical about superstitions, about ghosts, about God. That's, that's one of the things that I consider a superstition. That's, you know has blown to an incredible dimension throughout history. And uh, the reason I think that it's because many things in history have been explained, as you were saying, or Bernard Shaw was saying, <laughs> through superstition um, that could be and have been afterwards explained by science and philosophy. So yeah, it's, it's kind of stupid to think that we know everything nowadays, you know, and that we cannot evolve in our knowledge. It is stupid to think we know everything nowadays. There's still far more things unexplained by science than explained by science. <laughs> but they will be explained by science. Give it time. Oh, is that mm -hmm. a, t a touch of faith I hear in your voice? Sorry? A touch of faith? Uh, a little bit of faith in science? Oh, no. No, no, no. <laughs> Not at all. No faith it's, in science? Uh, no, it's complete, it's complete you know, knowledge. Skepticism in science? It's knowledge of science, actually. Know knowledge that, you know, it just takes time. Mm -hmm. You know, in order First to prove it's not faith. I can think you Patricia can means she's a very rational uh, person. No, she is not religious. She's not superstitious. What about you, Donica? I believe uh, you're just the opposite. Well, At first of point. all, to define superstitious is a, is a different thing altogether. Superstition is like um, it's regarded in very very traditional thinking, right? Traditional thinking of symbols, things like that which I don't necessarily subscribe to because an awful lot of them are ridiculous, right? But uh, a good example, right, that is maybe rooted in a deep human feeling is there's a superstition from Ireland, uh, it's called the Banshee, uh, that like when somebody, somebody close to you has died, you'll hear the wind howling in a particular way. It sounds like a lady crying and people have reported seeing the Banshee. Okay. I don't believe in this. You don't? I think it's rooted in something. I think it's rooted in some kind of deep feeling. And for the same thing, I think that way about religious thought. A lot of people think about religious thought like, uh, uh, what is it, um, Karl Marx said it's the, the opium of the people, which I think is a bunch of nonsense because that would, it, that would imply that somebody wrote the religious text as a means to control people. So I think everything's rooted in something, A. B, the reason I'm not, I'm not superstitious in a way, I'll walk under ladders all day, but what I- Do you believe in leprechauns? When, pardon? You believe in leprechauns? I'm going to count that. As, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to count that as a racist remark, right there. Oh yeah, she's super racist. 
Well, I mean, oh, come on. I mean, you do. You you you, do, you just. I'm just relating me, your culture to you yourself. You just mock me based on a demeaning like cultural symbol from your Catalan, no, yeah. No, I'm just asking. I, do you believe Madonna, in can let me ask you? You, don't, you believe in a boy I mean, pooping in the baby Jesus's crib? I mean, no, yeah, but I just I just said that I don't believe on, in any on, of on, that. Come on, come on, right, right. Tobacco okay, a little bit. Okay, don't fight, don't fight. What I, what I. Bad chance, Marcella. Today we're we're gonna go in some big time. <laughs> well, what I what I feel about it is is I've met many many people in my life who I deeply deeply respect who have had supernatural experiences. Wow. And I am unwilling to discount them all as liars, despite the fact that I never have myself I, I had never one. said that they're liars. I, I, I don't say, I, I'm not saying that people don't believe in that and that they're, com they're not completely honest when they tell you about their experience. I'm just saying that I don't believe there are, those are supernatural or... Uh, but, so what, you but think they're wrong? No, but, I think, yeah, I no, think but first of all, let's listen to these experiences that you just mentioned. Your friends had this supernatural experience. All right, for example, I, like there's uh, two off the bat that I, that I can mention um, very strongly. Um, I remember one time I was on, uh, I was on holidays with some uh, friends of mine. We were over in Poland, in a more remote part of Poland. We all went to, um, we all went to sleep in the same hostel room. Um, two beds here, one bed here, I'm in that bed, they're in those beds. Um, at the exact same point in the middle of the night, both of my w uh, friends woke up just, just screaming, just screaming, like, and at the same time. So I woke up naturally too. They're like, why? I, I said, why, why are you screaming? What, what's wrong? And they said, I had a dream that I, I was in this room, it was that I was just waking up in my sleep and there was a, just a giant black presence at the end of my bed. And both of them had the exact same dream at this exact same time. Now, I, at, the, at the time, I thought, I don't believe them, right? I, I didn't, didn't really be, uh, believe them. But it always stuck in my head. A few years later, I remember talking to a publican from where I'm from in Ireland. Very old man, very wise man, very well read. And skepticism was very much in fashion right then. Like, I mean, I suppose it still is. That's where you're probably getting it from. It was very, very in fashion at the time. So I was a young guy and I was like, eh, I don't believe in any of that stuff. I don't believe in ghosts, none of that. And uh, Declan, uh, the man's name, said to me, well, I mean, you would if you, if you worked around here. And I said, what? He said, there's a ghost that walks across the floor on Saturday night every weekend once the, once the pub is closed. I've seen him when I'm doing the cash all the time. Sometimes he acknowledges me, sometimes he doesn't. And I was thinking to myself, what reason would this man have to, to lie to me? He didn't have to impress anybody like that. And he was speaking very frankly. He wasn't trying to scare me. It didn't seem to scare him. It's, ju it's something that he had genuinely experienced. Now, but I didn't, didn't witness either of these. You didn't actually see. I didn't witness ghost. either of these. I just believe. I just believe you that person. Him. Pardon? I believe him, him. I believe my friends, and I believe I don't necessarily believe it's a ghost because I think that's a silly word to try and pin something down okay. that we don't understand. Maybe science could help us understand it someday, but I'm saying that I definitely, I'm like, I'm not going to say those those people are liars, those are idiots, they've misinterpreted reality. Okay. I'm saying they experienced something real. Hey, hell, you're putting words in my mouth that I'd never said. I mean, one of my best friends you know, is an author and he believes in all these things. And he told me, it's like, whenever you want, you can come to my castle in Scotland. Mind you, there's a ghost in there. I believe that he believes that he's an incredibly bright man. And um, So where has he I gone wrong? Eh? Where has he gone wrong in your view? Because you do believe he's gone wrong. No, no, no. What I think is that there's something that there's some things that we cannot explain yet. That That's what I'm saying. That Thank you. I win. No, 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 no. Don't. It's not finished. So let's let's let us yeah, speak. Can I just throw something at him? No, no, no. It's no, forbidden. please, no. Something, something <laughs> should get you know, okay, hit well, his head. Let's just uh, talk about something else. Uh, you said you know people who believe in yeah. these things, but you don't. My mom you believes them. in these things. Okay, so. Because you mentioned your mom, tell us something uh, about your family, like the weirdest superstition uh, in your family. Oh, we've Patricia. got we've got plenty of them. I mean, my my mom has plenty of them because he's, he comes from Andalusia, yeah. which, which is also a country that you know is very deep into that kind of superstition and stuff. But for example, she would um, light a candle every time each of us had a, a test. Mm -hmm. For example, you okay. know, and she, would, and she did that for her, um, my nephews and my niece, you know, throughout the years. And she still does that. Whenever someone has something important, she will light up a candle. It's a superstition. Yes. It doesn't okay. really work because of her no, candle. No, and it it's not even we, weird because we I know so many people who do that. Something mm -hmm. more uh, strange than that. Uh, yeah, that's kind of, a, a stuff more of a more uh, of a, uh, your a family symbolic ritual. Uh, do. Yeah. Um, my... Uh, 
Uh, for example, there, my um, father's family, uh, they live in a, they lived long ago, now only my uncle lives there, in a three-story dilapidated former landlord's house in, uh, in, in Ireland. And that sounds creepy It's already. creepy as all holy hell. It really, really, truly <laughs> is. Um, and in order to obtain that house, uh, some ancestors of mine and some townspeople marched up to the house where the English landlord was living at the time. Um, I think this was just post-famine. And uh, they hung him from a tree. And then my ancestors uh, took the house. Like, this was in the days of land ownership in Ireland. It was a pretty brutal time. And even since then, starting back then, they, the family that moved in, my ancestors' family, they lived only in the servants' quarters, right? Which was the, which was the bottom story of the house. And still, 150 years later, well, no, they eventually extended upstairs, but the top story was continued to be just abandoned, unused, you know? Because of ghosts? Basically, because they, they said, I don't want to be up there. There's a seriously bad energy up there because there, bad energies can definitely exist in places. It I'm does. sure you won't I mean, deny me that. Wasn't it Einstein who said that the, uh, the energy is not destroyed, it just change, changes? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I believe that. So I believe, believe that, that science, I believe that, you because, know, there's okay. many things we cannot explain yet. At some point or other, we will be able to explain those experiences of mm -hmm. ghosts, of um, presences, of telepathy, maybe. You yes. know, like a connection between the minds that made you two friends wake up at the same time, having the same dream, because, you know, that happens when you what leave with friend someone. Uh, in Scotland, what what do you think is making him believe that there's a ghost in his house? Really, from where you're standing. He's, he's, yeah. uh, you know, because he's weird and he's had these kind of experiences for himself, and I believe that he's had them. I'm not doubting him, but every time he tells me about one of them, I can't help but laugh. Can you tell us about you one know? of them? Uh, no, I can't. <laughs> okay, what about what about favorite numbers? Don't you guys have a favorite number? For example, I don't know in Ireland, in Romania, for example, uh, many people believe number seven brings you luck. For example, if you have a name um, uh, made of seven letters, it's considered to be a lucky name and stuff like that. Does that exist in Ireland or do you believe in this? I don't and no. I don't know. Like lucky numbers or? No. no. Like, I mean, there's there's definitely such a thing as like a number that, that, that makes you feel good. Like, like I mean, I, I kind of get that. Or lucky objects. Like, I, I've done... Uh, like what? Sorry? Lucky objects? Um, hmm. Something but that you only, like only, because, yeah. they're, only you. because they're related to a person that I love. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, they're, yeah, they're sentimental and it makes you feel good. Yeah, but but not because they're lucky. They're just there, you know. There'll be mm -hmm. things that remind me of someone, but luck not. is one of those strange words like ghosts, whereby something like that can transpire into into something good. I, like I'll give, give you a couple of examples. Um, I've got um, got some things be belonging to my grandmother that I would generally have a, in a bag with me if I'm working away at work and I'm just like, Ugh, I'm exhausted and I come upon this like little medallion my grandmother used to own, kind of gives me a, a little bit of a boost. Not saying that that's the energy of luck, but luck is the name that people have decided to give it to kind of underwrite it. Or like when I, whenever I used to run marathons, whenever I used to get to, yeah, seven, whenever I used to get to miles seven, 14 and 21, I, okay. just the number seven would pop into my head and I go, yeah, all right, we'll keep going with that. I see. No. Not for me. Okay. No. Well, anyway, I think time's up. Um, we've bit, uh, we've uh, have a bit of a dilemma here. I think uh, <laughs> you do. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I must say I'm a bit more with uh, Patricia today, uh, Donica. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> anyway, anyway, next time maybe you convince us more. Maybe you can bring a ghost or something. So <laughs> or a leprechaun. <laughs> well, Sorry. I'm, anyway, I, I'm still anyway, dying to hear your friend's story. Thank you story. both for coming. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. having me. Uh, thank you, Patricia. I'll see you next thank time. Thank you for having us. Uh, we're having a short break now, and we'll leave you with a quote by the German poet, novelist, and dramatist Goethe. We'll be back in a few minutes. We're back and ready to speak some more English. Throughout the rest of the show, we will be having music, expats living for the first time in an authentic experience in our country, and of course, our regular collaborators, Matthew Tree and Mark Broderick. However, before all this, let's meet our next guest. She's a popular singer in Catalonia, although she was born in Rochester, New York. She has a unique voice, 
for blues, rhythm and blues, and soul music. You will certainly recognize Monica Green. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, today's topic is superstitious. So, mm -hmm. are you a superstitious person? Okay, I don't um, actually believe in uh, the superstition of black cats uh, walking <laughs> under ladders and, yes. and, 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 and things mm -hmm. like that, but I do have a ritual which I, if I don't do it, um, before I have to perform, it, it makes me kind of nervous. I have to have a very uh, time by myself where I don't answer the phone, I don't I want to talk to anyone, I really don't want to mm -hmm. communicate with anyone, and I just go into my own world, which I call touching the air, feeling the air, That which means I have to get in tune with what I'm going to do and it's kind of like a meditational process mm -hmm. and if I don't feel like I have time to do that I get on stage really nervous and and I'm, I'm not really concentrating okay. on what I have to do so it's a preparation it's not a really a superstition but um, if I don't do it I, I feel kind of like oh I didn't have time for my you know to yes, get, prepare yes. myself it gives you self-confidence it gives I me self-confidence exactly mm -hmm. exactly okay. excellent well, uh, Monica, uh, you've been living here for 30 years. Yes. Um, in Catalonia, but you're from uh, the United States. Yes, I am. Yes, so, I am. Uh, so, what's, uh, what's the story in uh, just a few words? And if you go back to the United States a lot? Well, I do actually go back uh, a lot. I just arrived back from um, New York um, in, uh, on the 19th of September and I stayed for, for about 15 days. I try to go home as much as possible because all of my um, immediate family, my siblings, and, and um, um, live there and my parents, well, my, par my mother passed just uh, last month, but oh. um, we normally are always in touch. But um, coming here was an opportunity that um, I couldn't. I couldn't say no because I had. I had two opportunities, two two offers to either go to Japan or to come to Spain, and I thought that um, at the time I wasn't really a big sushi lover. I know Japan has much more different types of foods, <laughs> but um, I thought that I would. Um, it, it would be more easier for me to come to Spain because I have a lot of Latin uh, blood in me from my mother's side and. And, and my brothers have married a lot of uh, Latin women, and so I lived in the Latin area, Spanish-speaking area, so it was much more easier for me to, to adapt and come here. Mm -hmm. And you're still here? And I'm still here. 30 years. I'm still here 30 mm -hmm. years, and I don't plan on going anywhere else. <laughs> this is my home. Is it true that you started with the gospel, in a gospel uh, choir in church? Well, actually, I didn't start with the gospel choir church, no. no. I did not. Um, actually, it's a. I come from a background of a Muslim background upbringing, hmm. because my mother was a part of a movement uh, back in the '60s with Malcolm X and, 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 and Cassius Clay or, or Muhammad Ali, and I, I was. I had a lot of teachings in that, but my father wasn't a part of the the Islamic um, um, phase or not phase, but um, time and um, uh, that was growing in America during that era. But um, I was um, also told that we had the opportunity to choose what we wanted to do when we were old enough to have our say and say, listen, this is not where I want to go or this is not what I really want to uh, keep um, spiritually um, on that path. So my mother always gave us the, the right and, the, and the, you know, the freedom to choose our own religious uh, spirituality uh, uh, path, and and mm -hmm. I chose. And in um, your case, music. How did that? Uh, well, because uh, I come, come from I come from a Catholic grandmother. <laughs> wow, what a combination! It is a combination, <laughs> but see, that's America. That's mm. the wonder of America that you can um, uh, practice and and you can experiment and and look for your spirit spirituality in different. Okay, in, so in different music ways. comes from your grandma. My grandmother. Mm. My grandfather's a, a, a graduate of Juilliard School, and my grandmother is a, was a, a writer, a songwriter. And um, they had a, a, 
of a bunch of hits back in the 30s and 40s and mm. 50s. Excellent. That, and uh, what's yeah. the story with the Supremes? The Supremes was... <laughs> I love this story. Because Everyone, I don't know if what I heard is true or not, and yes. that's why I asked you this well, question. Well, when we came over here, we came over here, we did an audition in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, I did the audition with some other people, and they were looking to do the show mm -hmm. of the Supremes. So when okay. we came over here, we did the show of the Supremes. Not with. But not with Diana Ross, because we, okay. were, we were all much more younger. And so during that time, we did get a chance in Acapulco to get close to Mary Wilson and to meet them and to have Michael Jackson's father come and see us perform at the Hyatt Regency in Acapulco and came to see us afterwards and talk to us. So it, was a, it wasn't the Supremes, it was the show of mm -hmm. the Supremes. Mm -hmm. You've published already two albums and you are preparing a new one. Well, so, I, yes. so tell us a little bit about that. Well, this, um, this album um, actually is an album that I've been wanting to do for a while because my, my, the music was always more pop when I did my albums. I did more than two, uh, three albums. I did maybe in collaborations also. I did exactly. many more, many more. Mm -hmm. but um, for my own, because my my um, my strong my strong was always the stage. That was where my strength uh, to me lied, and I didn't really feel that I was like a recording artist. But I knew that that I that I had to do that to keep um, to keep the movement of, of of what I was doing alive and and to be relevant. But um, the music that I'm doing now is basically neo soul and the funk music okay so that was uh, something that I've always really wanted to do because a lot of people don't really understand the difference between R&B funk soul mm -hmm. and and it, it's a, mix, a mixture of it all but uh, funk and soul uh, and neo soul which is a new term for the combination of um, R&B and the music from before the era of soul music. It's a big movement in the, in, in the United States mm -hmm. with neo soul and in England. It's like new, no? It's a new form mm -hmm. of soul. And uh, you mentioned jazz before. Yes. And you're also a great fan of jazz. How I important is fan. jazz in your life? Ja jazz is a big part of my life because of my grandparents. They were jazz musicians. They were on jazz labels, on prestige labels. They met all the greats. Uh, I remember stories of um, my mother telling me sitting on Duke Ellington's lap and Pearl Bailey, Bill Bailey and her brother, or and many, many Louis Armstrong, and, and, and I can just name, a, go down the line that, that my grandmother used to have over or knew because she uh, grew up in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, my, of course, my mother's also a musician, and she's brought up in New York City, also in Brooklyn. You have a fascinating family story. Yes, I do. I think you we're should write a book, at least. Yes, because <laughs> it's so it, we, we're so diverse. I mean, um, my mother t taught us to always be true to ourselves, that we didn't have to follow anyone else, just to be true to yourself. So we have um, our families like the the UN because we're, we're uh, I have a brother married to a Japanese and then you have an, a, a, a brother's married to um, um, a Polish girl and another married to a, a, wow. a you know, what to a combination. German. And I'm with a, uh, married to a Catalan and, and then we just, uh, you know, from the islands and then you just have all this different cultural music. A great mixture. Music. Exactly. But I was going to ask before about scat singing. How would yes. you describe it? And uh, can you uh, give us a scat, demonstration? Of course, scat is like telling a story. Scat is telling a story almost like, it's almost like rapping. Mm -hmm. But you can put, it's almost like rapping and beatbox <laughs> at the same time. Would you time. give us a small demonstration? Okay, um, it goes in here, which goes round and round, oh, 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 You dance, and the angels sing, bip a doop a dip a doop a dip a doop a dip a doop 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 a do
But um, there's songs that, uh, that just can blow your mind because it's almost like telling the story, talking mm -hmm. the story while you're putting it to music. Mm -hmm. Exactly, you said it, it's mind blowing. It's mind blowing. And we need to stop here, but you are going to sing for us today? Yes, I am. Mm. Which Always. song is it? Well, it's a song that I would love to sing because it reminds me so much of the song that my mom and my grandmother used to sing to me and to us when we were younger. And it just always stuck with us. And it was a song that they used to do to all of our brothers and sisters. And uh, okay. it's called, I Want Jesus to Walk With Me. Mm -hmm. I Want Jesus to Walk With Me by with walk with me. and with uh, Monica Green. Monica, um, we'll hear you on stage in a second. Okay. Okay, thank you so much for coming. Thank you And good so luck much. with the album and with everything. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. And while Monica is getting ready on stage, let's check out some tips on idioms related to superstitions. Listen to our teacher Becca Bardaka from International House, Barcelona. Hi everybody. Today we're going to be looking at some expressions and idioms related to luck and superstition. So let's go. A very common expression we use is touch or knock on wood. We use this when we want to prevent bad luck. So I could say, for example, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow, touch wood, so it doesn't happen. One of my personal favorite expressions is fat chance. We use this when we want to say there's no chance of something happen happening. For example, I hope Tarantino casts me in his next movie. A friend could say, yeah, fat chance. Next, we have rotten luck. This literally means bad luck. So if something unfortunate happens, a mate could say, oh, rotten luck, bad luck. Which leads us to Murphy's Law. Now, this is quite interesting in the sense that it says that anything bad that can happen will happen. But still, it's best not to tempt fate. If you're tempting fate, you're risking things, you're taking unnecessary risks, so it's best not to do that. Another expression is pot luck. If you're talking about a selection or a choice being pot luck, it's completely random, it's not planned, you just have to go with that um, selection. One more saying that we use is, while the going is good, which means that you have to take advantage of a situation while it's still good and not when things start going wrong. So while the going is good, let's take advantage of this. Finally, we talk about the pros and cons of a situation, which literally means the positives and the negatives, the good sides and the bad sides. That's it for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks very much. Bye. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me. All alone, my endless journey. I want Jesus to walk with me. Ooh, in my trials, walk with me. In my trials, walk with me. Love.
us journey. I want Jesus, Jesus, Jesus to walk with me. Violin on Tuesday is back luck in Moldova. True or false? Mark Broderick is answering these and other tricky questions in a minute. Do you know what curse means? Well, there are many verbs related to superstitions, and our Australian teacher Tim Gilly from International House Barcelona will explain the meaning of some of them. So we invite you to watch the last tip of today's show. Take note. Hi, so today we're talking about luck and superstition, so let's take a look at some verbs we use. And the first one, of course, is to cross, like to cross your fingers. And of course, that's what you do if you want to wish somebody luck or you want luck for yourself. Now, I myself, I'm feeling very lucky because I've been searching for an apartment and I found one and it's great. So I feel like I've lucked out. To lucked out is to be very lucky. And let's say you're even more lucky, like going to the casino and winning big. Well, we say you hit the jackpot. Now, not everybody is as lucky as that. Some people feel like they would never win at the casino. Maybe they've never even won a lollipop before. Well, we might say that they're cursed. And to curse somebody is to send a negative magic spell towards them. Now, these days, we also use curse in a different meaning. That's when we swear at somebody or shout very angrily at them. That's to curse somebody. Now, a typical to curse would be to doom somebody into doing an action or repeating something for the rest of their lives. It's in their destiny. Now, you may be doomed to repeat something. Um, it's very dramatic, but it's also used a lot in stories and fairy tales. Now, if you don't want to be doomed to do something, you might want to wear a magical necklace like an evil eye to ward off bad spells and evil spirits. Or you might need to go and see a magical old grandmother and she can free you from a curse. And right now, well, I'm going to free you from my presence. So until next time, I'll see you. but today I have the feeling that our here and there section is going to be fun. Everywhere in the world there are superstitions so it won't be difficult to compare them. And we've got with us today as usual Matthew Tree and uh, Mark Roderick. Hi. So are you superstitious guys? Absolutely. 
No. And you? No. No more, no longer. Not I used to no be incredibly longer. superstitious, you know. I used to I used to believe in astrology. I used to believe in UFOs because I'd seen one. Uh, I, I used you to believe in... Sorry, sorry you've really? seen a UFO? Sorry. Yeah, when I was 12 years old, I saw a UFO. <laughs> but not just me. Me and a group of people, including adults, uh, we really? all saw it. Yeah. Where? Yeah, yeah. In uh, southeast England, mm -hmm. in a small village. Wow. And uh, it was just hanging there in the sky, completely motionless, with sort of a row of little windows, and then it disappeared. Do you realize this is an exclusive? This I mean, is definitely this is a, an exclusive. Like a Don't they have a TV something? show for people like this? I mean, who Matthew have these Tree spottings? has seen an UFO. Yeah. Can we actually? Uh, say that? I mean, we should tell well, the viewers to pay attention. <laughs> I mean, no, to repeat it, I mean, to repeat it because it's not a joke. I mean, no, no, it's not a joke. No, no. But I, I later I did a lot of reading on, on UFOs because precisely because I'd seen one and then wow. I. Uh, well, we didn't know that. Before. No, that's, I mean, it's, that's this shocking. Is like, uh, yeah, it's a bit shocking. I came prepared with all these superstitions, <laughs> but I might as well just throw them all out the window. You've seen a UFO. Oh my God, Matthew, yeah. you need to prepare us before. I mean, we need to know these things. Yeah, I was just trying to be spontaneous. You know? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, Mark, you've been in uh, Banyolas, and you yes. haven't seen any UFOs. No, I didn't see any UFOs, but allegedly there is the story of a monster. Now, I talked to loads of people there, and it was very inconclusive as to what kind of a monster it was. Was it a dinosaur? Was it a big crocodile? Was it a dragon? Was it a... Uh, I don't know. So we asked a few people to give us the background on the story, but I didn't really come to many conclusions after it because nobody could get the story mm. straight. Interesting. So it wasn't like Loch Ness. Okay, but it was something. <laughs> yes. In, uh, in Bagnolas. Yeah, mm? it was so really let's fun. watch the video. Yeah. Welcome to Banyolas, the home of a famous monster, similar to Loch Ness. And today we're going to talk about superstitions, and that's why I'm wearing my lucky color green. There is a monster uh, here in Banyolas, the same as uh, a Ness. Loch Ness, exactly. Yeah. You have to be careful because it appears sometimes and it can bite you. <laughs> and also, if you fall into Banyolas Lakes, you can appear in Mallorca. There's a tunnel that goes direct to Mallorca. So there's no more need for Ryanair or Buelling. You just come to the Lake of Banyolas. It's much easier, really. <laughs> Is there a monster in the Lake of Banyolas? No. 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 If you talk to people from Banyolas, they tell you different things. Someone says it's a, a dinosaur, someone tells it's a giant crocodile from uh, Tyrannosaurus. Some of them tell you it's a big fish, an enormous fish with a mouth. Uh, it's very... Uh, it depends on the person. It was a, a, a clerical a person. Uh, a ah, like a, uh, a monk. That, that, that catch the dragon just okay. to, to prevent that the, the people uh, suffer uh, offer, offering ladies in, to the dragon. They offered ladies to the dragons? Yes, yes in Manolas, yes. Do you think there's a monster in the lake? I don't know, but, I, but we got our swimming suits here, then I maybe can, then I maybe can look. <laughs> you can go and have a look, no? <laughs> maybe. I don't know because I've never been here before. So it's the first time and now, for now, I, I, I haven't seen the, the monster. Not yet. Not yet. In Ireland we're very superstitious. They say that before the night somebody dies, a banshee comes to the house and wails outside the door. True or not? What do you think? First superstition. Matthew, we'll start with you this week. Is it true or not? I would say yes. You know where I discovered the Banshees, the existence of Banshees was in Marvel Comics because there used to be a Marvel comic character that's true. that was the Banshee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'd say yes. And you, Marcella? Well, I'm not sure whether it's uh, true or not, but what I know for sure is that it's uh, scary. It's, I mean, it's, it's a scary story just to it imagine. Is. Something like that. I have a very good a story creepy. about a banshee, actually, and it is actually true. It's an Irish superstition about the banshee. I'll tell it to you very, very briefly. So there's an old man, and he's dying. He's on his deathbed, and he's with his grandson. And the grandson walks outside, and he goes out to smoke a cigarette. And suddenly, he sees the banshee coming to the, do to the door, and he goes over and starts talking to her. And he starts flirting with her, and they develop a relationship, and he takes her off into the night. And every night she comes back, he goes outside and smokes a cigarette and takes her away. And all of the time, the grandfather is still alive, until eventually 
you know, that uh, they elope and they disappear and he saves his grandfather by falling in love with the Banshee because then he prevents the Banshee from wailing outside the door. Hmm. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> that's Was the that superstition. A... No, okay. it's a silly story. That's, what, a... that's a silly okay. superstition from <laughs> Ireland about the Banshee. But they say, it, I think it's the sound of the, the, the wind coming in off the, off the coast. Mm. It has this howling, you know, this howling feeling. So I, I guess see. they associated this with this superstitious mm. Banshee back in the day. Creepy. Yeah, it's but creepy. Banshee yeah. means uh, spirit. No? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, Matthew, what about superstitions in uh, Britain? Superstitions in, in Britain. Um, in fact, uh, our scriptwriter Santi has given me two superstitions which I had no idea existed. Uh, one is to protect a house from witches, uh, you have to plant a rowan tree. I, I don't, I wouldn't recognize a rowan tree if one, you know, knocked Bit me you on the, on the nose. Yes, exactly. If it was alive. Yeah, or <laughs> presented itself. And hawthorn uh, should not be brought into the house before May Day because it belongs to the woodland god and uh, would bring bad luck. And I, I don't know what Hawthorne looks like either. Okay, so Hawthorne, Hawthorne's got a white flower on it. We have lots oh, yeah? of it in Ireland, yeah. Okay. Hawthorne's got a white flower on it. And the second uh, one uh, you've got? When you visit a new baby for the first time, you have to press a silver coin into its hand, uh -huh. which doesn't make much sense. I mean, if the baby was 15, you'd say it would make sense giving it a silver coin, but uh, it's a tradition. It's, uh, it's also done in, in Romania. Really? Um, yes, yeah? exactly. It's the, I don't know the meaning of it, but... Uh, so they take a silver coin and they, they press it into the They used to do that child's... a long time ago. Okay. No, okay. just not, uh, not in the baby's hand. Just, I don't know, give, it, uh, give a coin to the mother or just offer a coin. Okay. Which I suppose uh, is good luck supposed for to the symbolize... Future. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Good luck and good fortune. Okay. Yes. So I guess that's quite universal. Okay, so um, these were superstitions in the old times. What about at uh, present, in the present days? In, in Britain, hmm. uh, there's, there's one which I've never seen people practice, but which still exists, that if you put a pair of shoes on top of a table, oh, it's, yeah. it's bad luck because it symbolizes the death of a family member. Oh, that's harsh. Yeah, but which is, who, who's going to arrive into somebody's house, take off their shoes, put it on the table and say, you know, it makes absolutely no sense. No sense I read that one as well, and I was like, that makes no sense. What am I going to do? Arrive into Matthew's house first time and say, hey, Matthew, how are you? Take off my shoes and go, bang. That's not very likely. I did find a superstition, like looking through these things, a superstition in Brazil, which makes total sense. Oh, go on. So much sense. In Brazil, apparently, if if you leave your wallet on the ground, it means that you will have financial bad luck. If you leave your wallet on the ground, obviously you're going to have financial bad luck. Well, actually you I know. heard that one, but it's not about a wallet, it's about a handbag. A handbag, right, so well, yeah, the money If you leave your handbag no? on, the, on the floor, it's supposed to bring you uh, bad luck, financially speaking. And I think that's kind of universal uh, as well. But anyway, talking about superstitions um, at present, in modern times, um, uh, Matthew, I was like, a bit shocked to find out the fact that you actually uh, you claimed that you saw a UFO before. So uh, I would like me and, and Mark uh, are quite surprised, and we'd like you to tell us more about it. Oh, it was I was 12 years old. I was with a group of friends and my these friends' parents in a village. I still remember the name of the village. It was a hamlet, really, a tiny village called Thorpe Ness in East Anglia. And one night, one of the adults went out and said, come and look at this. And we all went out, and there was this object that was absolutely still in the sky with a little row of lit windows and one kind of bright light on its left-hand side. And it was just there, you know, and everybody was just staring, mesmerized at it. The adults as well, that's what really impressed me. Went back to bed, and in the morning, we asked uh, the adults about it, and they came up with this story about it was planes refueling in midair. And I didn't believe it because that, that was a new like a thing. Movie. It had been on the telly uh, a couple of days before. We'd watched the program. Okay. Okay. And suddenly they came up with this explanation and it looked 
like they were saying this just not to frighten the kids. I see. But for me, it's still something inexplicable. You guys have but an area at the moment, you believed it, but but then you said that you stopped believing in in these well, things. Well, I read a lot about about UFOs um, because I did believe in them for years. Like for years means until I was about 50, you know. And so uh, not too long ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, until the very very until recent last past. week. Yeah, until <laughs> last week. Thank you, Mark, for that. Uh, you know, I owe you a drink or three. Um, <laughs> and I found out that, in fact, for almost everything except one or two percent of cases, there are explanations mm -hmm. uh, for, for these things. They're unidentified flying objects until they get identified, obviously. <laughs> of but course. the identification <laughs> comes along. Uh, sometimes it takes years and years and years mm. for the, these things to be identified correctly. What I saw the monster in Bagnolas, by the way. But in, in an engraving. I saw ah. an engraving of ah. the monster in Bagnolas. Oh, was, was it a dinosaur, me. a dragon, or a crocodile? It was like a miniature Loch, Loch Ness monster with legs. <laughs> and there's a, an engraving of it being walked along on a lead by the French priest who tamed it and stopped it from harming people. <laughs> but how it could have harmed anybody, because <laughs> it's this tiny little thing. You know, it's a, it's okay, like well, the when you say that you monsters. saw the Bagnolas monster for a moment, I was scared because I thought, oh my God, UFOs, and he actually saw the yes, uh, but the but I'm completely sane, Marcello. <laughs> no, 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 okay. it was in an engraving. So I'm relieved, but There's anyway. nothing wrong with me. I know that. I know. <laughs> I know that, Matthew. Mm. Anyway, what about Catalans? Do you think Catalans are superstitious? Uh, no, listen, I come from Ireland, and Ireland we're supremely superstitious. We've got stories of fairies and leprechauns and all of these wonderful things. And I come here, and I don't. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't have the feeling that they're very superstitious here. Lots of people uh, seem to have issues with the uh, black cats. Uh, yeah, the crossing of the black cat in front of the road. No, it's always sign allegedly signifies. Uh, something bad is going to happen to you, no? I, I would believe that. I remember going around as a kid, my mother was supremely superstitious. She would like, the, especially the magpies. Every time I would hear her talking in her own, she would be talking to the magpies outside. Like, you know, one for sorrow, two for, what was it? One for sorrow, two for lust? I don't Three know, for, Mark, We had I a, my, well, I don't know. I, I was looking at you because I don't know, do you, oh. did you have this in, in England as well? No. no wait, my mother had this little song about magpies and she would sing the song to the magpies as they were coming in and out just to keep the bad luck away mm -hmm. and going under ladders and all of these things is, it mm -hmm. were supremely superstitious okay. and I believe some buildings didn't even have the 13th floor in yes. well, we didn't have 13th well, floor in buildings the United in States the United yeah. States yeah mm -hmm. it happens and planes floors. even planes and the number 13 mm -hmm. there's that weird thing that in uh, which I noticed very quickly when I came here to live was that Friday the 13th is always the in the Anglo-American world at least yeah. is yes. is the unlucky day or the mm. you know they've got all those movies you know Friday the 13th but here it's Tuesday the 13th you know for yes. some reason but Tuesday the you know yeah yeah it's like yeah hmm. well the same as April Fool's Day is different here as well yes. April Fool's Day is the first and here it's the in 26th or 27th of uh, December right where they play the trick, what is it? The, 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 the Day of the, the Innocence. innocence. The innocence. Yes. Yeah. I, I still have a couple of superstitions hung over from childhood, which I still respect. I cross mm -hmm. my fingers every time I go under scaffolding or a ladder. Okay. Um, you know, and I, in fact, I'm so ashamed of it, I stick my fingers in, the, in my pockets when I do it because I don't want anyone to see me doing it. Mm -hmm. But um, okay, nobody I, don't, I don't think that means I'm an idiot. I really want well, to see. It <laughs> I really want to see the picture of Matthew, you know, coming along and going like this and going, you know, like putting your guns away and walking. That's exactly <laughs> walking, what I do. Walking under yeah. the scaffolding. Okay. Because you come from Ireland yes. and you always mention beer, are there any superstitions related to beer? Um, superstitions related to beer. I can tell you that the way. The, um, Okay, the Guinness, for example. How, how you pour the Guinness is really important in Ireland. Mm -hmm. not, and I, I don't know really is it a superstition, but a lot of people will not drink the Guinness unless it's poured in a specific way, mm -hmm. which is three quarters of the way, let it sit, and then top it. And you must drink it in four gulps. This is the, 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 the real way of drinking Guinness. Now, I'm not sure is it a superstition or does it taste better or why, etc. but we do. I know all of my Guinness drinking friends, they do this. They, and they will not drink it out of a can or a bottle that is just sacrilegious. That is ridiculous. So it's, that would well, be it's them. not, it's more the, um, a ritual, no? Rather yeah, than it's a more of a ritual, I guess, than a superstition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, other ones than that, I don't know, actually, no. Well, don't uh, worry, uh, because I think you've got more material. I do. Uh, from Bagnola. I do indeed. What have you discovered in the last part? Well, uh, you're going to find out. That would be, that would be spoiling the surprise. 
Okay, we don't want to do that. So let's watch it first. Have you ever had uh, an unusual experience, magical or spiritual or superstitious in your life? Yeah, the day I met her. Oh, can you give me something less cheesy than that? When I listen to some sound without lights and sleeping in my home alone. The morning my mother died, my sister uh, called me and she said, it's so strange because um, uh, I looked on my uh, uh, phone and all of a sudden uh, the day of birth for t uh, 2019 is, is cancelled. And she said, so silly, because she asked her husband, did you do it? Why you did it? Because I don't like it. Mama's birthday, the, uh, the 92nd birthday is next year. Why you cancelled? No, I didn't do anything. An hour later, my mother was dead. Sometimes I have uh, dream something that then it, it uh, happens, really. Yeah, once when I was 10 years old, uh, I was just uh, showing some magic trick with cards to a friend, and next to me, the door just locked itself. And Do oh, wow, so somebody was in there locking you inside? Yeah, I don't know, but it was locked after my, my magic trick, and that's it. I have one last question. If I cut off all of your beard, yeah. will you lose your strength? No, but my, my woman will kill you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It, t it tickles her all in the right places. Good man. Superstition in Sri Lanka. Every year, when the boys become 12 years of age, they have to race to a coconut tree and grab a coconut. The last person to grab a coconut is said not to ever get married in his life, and he is then ostracized from the village. True or not? Would, would you like me to repeat that one? It was slightly complicated. Yes, please. At this time, you, no cross-examining, okay? okay? So at the, <laughs> at the age of 12 in Sri Lanka, okay, boys have to climb up the coconut trees, okay, and grab a coconut. And the last one to grab a coconut will never get married. And basically is ostracized from the, from the society, well, from society, from their tribe or group. All because family. of coconuts. All because of coconuts. It's coconuts. I would say <laughs> yes, but maybe not the ostracizing bit. No, not the ostracizing bit. Yeah. You, you, you're finding fault in my, in my wording, no? Okay. No, I just think that's more <laughs> unlikely, that's all. <laughs> I think that's think? highly unlikely. Highly unlikely. Uh, well done, it's, it's, not, it's not true. I invented it on the really? spot. Really? Yeah. Really? I invented because it on the spot. Because it was like a was really well mark like humor or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, I could get better at this whole lying thing. Do you want to, I have got a few more for you if you Mark's want. One of Mark's jokes. Yeah. <laughs> I have a few more. Do you want to hear them? Sure. Yeah? Okay. I'm not sure, but yeah, okay. <laughs> so basically, I, I'm not really keeping score now because I think basically you, you, you're even no one one at this stage. So I've just got three more for you, okay? And they're quite, they're quite funny and quite interesting as well. So <clears throat> I, I have a little heading as well for them. Eating goat meat could get hairy. Okay, that's the heading, all right? Superstitious women in Rwanda don't eat goat meat over fear that it would cause them to grow facial hair. That's true. That is true. Ah, and, okay, okay. Uh, okay, you no seem idea. very definitive on that. <laughs> uh, why? Yeah, because How do you know that? Before this program, I spent hours on the internet looking at superstitions, and that one came up. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. well done. I will have to get my superstitions from another source apart from <laughs> the internet. God damn it. Okay, the last one. Playing the violin on Tuesday is bad luck in Moldova. It's considered bad for business. Um, Moldova, that's... Yeah, it's, it's, that's, yeah, that's, 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 they speak that's, Romanian in Moldova. Yeah, well... Uh, is it Moldavia? I think Moldavia. it is in Moldavia. 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 And, um, Moldavia. Okay, I thought I would so say Moldova. That um, I would say yes, but because it is considered that Tuesday is uh, is a day uh, with lots of like bad luck. Uh, if I'm not wrong, like three hours of bad luck every Tuesday. In uh, okay. In, I, don't um, know, I don't know whether you're lying to me now or <laughs> you're really good at this. Uh, okay, you no, think no, it's no. true? No, no, no. In Eastern countries, Eastern European countries, I think Tuesday is considered a day uh, with three hours of bad luck. Interesting, hmm? Matthew. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's possible. Yeah. No, I invented that one myself. It was quite, quite, oh, well quite. Done. Uh, yeah, really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I invented it off the top of my head. Absolutely. But you're not no supposed to invent, idea to invent them. It was true or you're false. I invented <laughs> the ones that were false. I would use my imagination. You're supposed to uh, to, to give us like real. Uh, no, I give you two. I give you two real ones and one completely false one.
which was the playing the violin on a Tuesday in Moldova. I just imagined the picture of, you know, <laughs> all violins have to be locked up on Tuesday all in Moldova. Right. I would say that he has a lot of <laughs> imagination, no? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should start writing books like you. I mean. mm. Well, um, anyway, what surprised you guys about um, superstitions here in Catalonia? Any Catalan superstitions or strange rituals that you, you've been surprised by? Uh, Matthew, maybe you can yeah, no, grab the, that the, one. The first one, which I now find completely normal and I do this every year, but the, the first New Year's Eve that I spent uh, in Catalonia, I discovered that, um, you know, after you've eaten a meal, you've had some wine to drink and everything, when the bells toll for, for New Year, for every toll of the bell, you're supposed to stuff a grape into your mouth. God, and if yeah. you don't do it in time, uh, it's bad luck for the rest of the year. And I mean, trying to shove 12 grapes, uh, 12 grapes into your, in into your mouth in 12 seconds yeah. is, it's, That's quite uh, and then everyone tries to kiss each other yes. afterwards when <laughs> they've got their mouths full of grapes. I mean, it's just, I thought that was really, really weird. And the other one, which um, they taught me on the Planet de Beak, and I've never heard of it since, but in 1714, when Barcelona was under siege, there were a group of traitors within Barcelona who had a signal to open the gates and let the Bourbonic troops in and take over the city. And the signal was to take uh, a piece of bread and put it upside down. Mm. And I remember once I was in a place in the Plan of the Beak and there was this upside down piece of bread on the table and immediately they put it the right way up and explained why it was bad luck to have the bread the wrong way round, upside down, because uh, that was what the traitors used to open the gates of Barcelona in 1714. Okay, I never heard of that. Never no. heard of it. Mm. Anyway, have you ever harvested olives? Uh, grapes, yes. Olives, never. No. Mm? Apples. I've harvested <laughs> apples, but olives, never. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm asking that because our next section is called First Timers and our next guest had never harvested olives. Now that the time of the new oil harvest is approaching, our teammate, Juan Cama, has taken Noah Levin from the United States to an olive grove in Navas, in Bages, to live that experience. Let's see his first timer in action. In Catalonia, we have a very special kind of gold. We are talking about the liquid gold. That's why we're taking our first timer today to discover how olive oil is made. Hey Noah, how are you doing? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm fine, thank you so much. Where do you come from? Uh, USA. Uh, you're about to live a very rural experience, I would say. Here's Aina, she's part of the staff of Midjourn. Today we've come here to learn how the olive oil is made. Uh, and everything starts here, right? All starts with this stick. It's a mechanical stick. You have to brush, to brush the branch, for, but gently, for not damage the, um, the olive and not damage the olive tree. That is very cool. I love that olives are harvested by tickling the trees. Great, an awesome job. <laughs> <laughs> I am an olive farmer, this is amazing. When you're holding it all the way up, your whole body starts shaking, which is really fun, but also hard to do for farm work. And I could imagine if you're doing it all day, every day for the whole harvest, it's pretty tough work. After leave the, the olives to the mill, we take it to here and we keep it here inside the, those tanks. And here we have the different varieties that you produce. Which one is the most special? Corbella. Corbella is a variety that only grows uh, in this site. It grows near the river Cardanet. So it's an autochthon variety and Midjourn project started with that objective. We have all ready to make the taste. First of all, we have to take the number one, the glass of number one, yeah? And we have to, to warm, no, the, the glass. Um, it's because we have to smell it, and I want that all the flavors uh, get inside. Okay, let's play the game. 
Do you find any fruit in it? I, I want to say banana. <laughs> yeah? Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. When you find um, a fruit only smell, smelling the olive oil, it means that it's um, virgin or extra virgin olive oil. Now that we have already smelled it, can we try it or...? We have to try it and we have to put it uh, belong all the tongue, yeah? Because at the end of the tongue you can find the bitters. And um, two qualities of the extra virgin olive oil is the, the bitter and the spicy. on the side of my tongue, and then the back just sort of comes in slowly and, and waves hello. <laughs> I like that. I never thought about having olive oils where you're really getting the aroma and accentuating it, and to try that out was very cool with an expert. There's no better way to finish this report than by tasting more oil. Yeah, we have which, to put it in <laughs> real context. <laughs> yeah, which one do you want to pick? Uh, I think my favorite is the Corbella. Mm -hmm. But looking at these fine embutites, I think the Piqual would probably be the best because it will stand up to these savory flavors. I'm an expert now. I think I'm going to uh, add to my Arabicina cooking oil um, maybe some corbella um, oil for, for salads and for tasting that's a little bit finer and a little bit more flavorful. So, you should all leave the olium experience. Bon appetit. Well, thank you very much, uh, Juan and uh, Nawa. And olive oil is uh, very common here, but not so common in, uh, in Britain. Uh, were you surprised of the fact that it's so common here when you first arrived? Yeah, when I first arrived, yes, because when I first arrived, which uh, the very first time in the late 70s, olive oil was something that was only sold in Britain in tiny little bottles, to, and very expensive bottles, to sprinkle over um, salads if you were middle class. <laughs> you know, that would be the... Uh, but now it's become completely normal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. In Ireland, we use butter. Uh, I suppose like England as well. Yeah. The basis of all of the cooking was butter all the mm -hmm. time. And olive oil, as he said, like I grew up in the 80s, uh, olive oil, we didn't have it. But when we did have it, let's say in the 90s and that, super expensive. And again, mm. middle class people would use it. But now, it, now it's everywhere. Now with mm -hmm. the Italian export, yes. the Spanish yes, export, yeah. etc., it makes it... Yeah, and more. did you know that here in uh, Catalonia they even have uh, an expression that goes like as bagut oli, meaning that you're in deep trouble. Yeah, which you are actually if you drink oil directly. <laughs> I mean, but it's a it's a nice expression. I've never I've never heard that anywhere mm -hmm. else. But so they also say that if you drink just a little bit before going to a party, for example, or uh, on a day when you are expected to drink lots of alcohol, it helps you because it creates like a kind of a, um, a, a protection, protection yes, in your stomach to prevent you from So what you're telling Mark, for getting from drunk? Something like that. Well, this so is what they say. I haven't oh, invented I'm, it. I'm, go I'm going to tell this to everybody in Ireland. We've just discovered new <laughs> things. Forget about putting olive oil on your food, lads. Take a drink of it before you go and have some beers. That's brilliant. Excellent. I've never, I've never okay. heard Between the UFOs and learning no, to drink more, this is brilliant. In fact, I'm, I'm going to a party tomorrow, so <laughs> I'll, I'll start off with the olive oil. Yeah. But just a tiny <laughs> not, bit. Not the cheap yeah, yeah. stuff. Just uh, a not the cheap stuff. No, no, something, something, something uh, like grade a, a, a olive oil. Yes. A little bit. Mm. I think I that's very interesting. I think you might have saved the whole population of Ireland from getting drunk for the next year. St. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Patrick's okay, Day. Okay, anyway, anything similar in your cultures, sayings like that? About um, 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 olive oil, about no. uh, beer, <laughs> but specifically about, about olive oil, olive oil anything. <laughs> water. Uh, sayings? No, I can't. No, I can't remember any sayings. So and well, day keeps the doctor away. And that's a good one. Keeps the that's that's, a that's good the one. tip. That's the typical mm -hmm. one. It's the one that comes to the tip of my tongue. We can now replace it with a glass of olive oil a day will mm -hmm. keep you sober. Well, anyway, we're, <laughs> we're, we're talking today <laughs> <laughs> about superstitions, yes. And, uh, well, um, Halloween yep. 
which Irish. has just uh, finished, mm -hmm. uh, is, um, I believe, an Irish tradition. It is. It comes from the pagan festival Saun, okay, which uh, was celebrated years before Christianity arrived in Ireland. Basically, at the end of the harvest, uh, on the last night of the harvest, they would burn a big bonfire and they would celebrate. It would, they would called it the night when the, the other, other world was close to ours, like the, the world of the dead, no? And they burned this, these fires to keep away the evil spirits and celebrate the end of the harvest. And that was celebrated during many, many centuries in Ireland until in the late 1800s with the famine and all that, a lot of Irish emigrated to the United States. And they took this tradition with them, okay? And uh, what they did was actually, I read recently in the early 1900s, the whole idea of trick-or-treating actually came from the Irish who were trying to extort people. So basically they said that they went to the doors, they knocked on the doors and they said, listen, we're not going to break all your windows mm -hmm. and we're not going to smash things if you give us something. Okay. So it was like that was the beginning of the trick or treat, so to speak. I In see. fact, it was a trick or I'll break your windows. It was a protection racket. It was a protection yeah. racket. That's how the Irish made the money, I suppose. And then okay. it, it kind of evolved mm -hmm. into uh, the next step, which was the whole trick or treat thing, the Halloween. Uh, they bought it because the monsters, the, you know, the Frankensteins and the Draculas and all of this. And there's a lot of uh, games that we played growing up and a lot of superstitious things we did on that night, which were really. I remember Halloween is actually my favorite. Uh, holiday mm -hmm. growing but up. But you mentioned Dracula. Yeah. That's Romanian, okay? Uh, invented by an Irishman, <laughs> Bram Stoker. He was from it's Dublin. True. Well, it is true. It's true. He was well, invented by an Irishman. Mm -hmm. There you go. And uh, well, I think um, because of him, uh -huh. lots of Romanian people are very superstitious. You think so? Do you have any strange superstitions according to that? Well, we've got lots, but yeah. we don't have time now to talk Fair about enough. all the Romanian superstitions because we need like three programs, I think. Oh, wow, okay. But anyway... That's a new um, book for us. <laughs> but about, yes. about this one, it's yeah. worth pointing out it really is an Irish tradition that uh -huh. went to America because in England it was never celebrated until about 15 years ago. Yeah. When suddenly it, it sort of it was imported from, from America. Mm -hmm. Halloween, by the way, is... Um, uh, is the Old English for uh, Holy Evening. Holy Evening. Hallowed okay. Evening. Hallowed wow, Hallowed 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 I'm impressed. Evening, yeah. I learned so many new things today, right? I need to take notes before I forget them all. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for coming. No it's problem. been fun thank today you. to talk about uh, superstitions. Yeah, it has. See yeah. you next nice. time. And well, poker, olive harvesting, a red carpet in Los Angeles, superstitions from all around the world, and good music. It has been a show so full of experiences. Next week we'll be back with more. But meanwhile you can follow our profile at the Weekly Mag TV on Twitter and Facebook. And since today we've talked a lot about bad luck, our farewell quote is also about that. This time we don't know who the author is, but he or she is certainly right. See you next week and remember to keep your English up and running. journey I want Jesus, 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 Jesus to walk